Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? It is Thursday, July 9th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live to tape steps and steps and steps. From the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America. Downtown Bro- uh, Brooklyn, Bro- yeah, Brooklyn, USA. That's right, folks. It's vacation week. I'm recording this prior to vacation week, which is why I can barely like stumble through this. I need it bad. Uh, but over the past week and a half or two, I have been doubling up on interviews so that you could all have fresh content. Yes, I know. It was nice of me. And today, we have journalist Frank Smith on the NRA, the Unauthorized History. He has been covering the NRA for more than 20 years. And... um, has some very interesting insights into that uh, decrepit organization, which I hope. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't. I think it's from from what Frank says, the uh, its reports of its demise are greatly exaggerated, or whatever. Whatever the very I don't know the 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 classic way of saying that is um, the idiom. They're still around. They're still around, folks. Um, and we will be back uh, next week live, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of uh, next week. But if you are hankering for daily news, amquickie.com, seven, eight minutes, all the top headlines, all, a lot of the stories that we would end up talking about on the Majority Report, we at least cover headline form uh, every morning at amquickie.com. So check that out. Go sign up for it right now. amquickie.com, you can sign up. It's all free, totally free. Find that podcast and share it. It's a great thing to share with your friends, with your normie friends, people who don't listen to politics on a regular basis. It's a great way to, you know, have them hear the news like they would on their, you know, AM talk radio station or something like that, or the NPR, you know, news brief, but but actually, you know, with a little bit more attitude and a little bit more um, sort of uh, reality, frankly. Let's be honest. We don't, uh, we don't, take politicians' words for it. We don't take any, you know, we get, uh, uh, we're a little bit more jaded. Is that what I was saying? A little more left-oriented. I don't know what the word is, but um, but check that out, a- amquickie.com. Also, of course, uh, TMBS did a show this week. Uh, check that out, patreon.com slash the Michael Brooks show or a TMBS rather. And you can find the Michael Brooks show on uh, YouTube, youtube.com TMBS and check out, um, uh, know me show, patreon.com, the no show. N O M I K I show. You can find that also on youtube.com, the no show. Um, she's interviewing a lot of, uh, great guests and, uh, has, uh, some opinion and, um, check it out. Very good uh, uh, perspective on 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 uh, left and democratic politics. Um, also, of course, the Antifada. You can find that at patreon.com slash the Antifada and literary hangovers, Twitch uh, TV stream. Check all those out. Um, in the meantime, you can support this program by becoming a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. It's very helpful when you do. Much appreciated. Also, don't forget, JustCoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. All right, quick break, and we're going to be talking to uh, Frank Smith on the unauthorized history of the NRA. Members, uh, stick around. I think we might have something from the vault for you today. I'm not 100% sure, as I've been saying all week. 
But uh, check it out. All right. Frank Smith, the ANRA, the Unauthorized History. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program freelance journalist Frank Smith, who has covered the NRA for more than 25 years, uh, writing uh, in the Village Voice, in the Washington Post, uh, MSNBC.com, and uh, the Progressive. He won a Society of Professional Journalists National Investigative Award for his Mother Joan story, Unmasking NRA's Inner Circle. This was after the Sandy Hook massacre. Uh, And now he has written the NRA, the unauthorized history. Uh, Frank Smith, welcome to the program. Thank you, Sam. Pleasure to be here. All right. So let's go through um, the 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 history of the NRA. Um, I think uh, folks have some awareness, probably in part, frankly, from your reporting over the years. Uh, but uh, it is it, 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 it's good to um, remind everyone on the development uh, of this organization to understand where they are today. This originally started uh, was originally started by some former Union soldiers following the uh, Civil War. W- what was the purpose of of the NRA at that time? And uh, w- tell us a little bit about its founding. Well, the men who founded the NRA were all veteran Union officers, one of whom uh, was a brevet uh, lieutenant colonel and also had been a journalist during the early years of the war. And they they had seen the lack of marksmanship during the Civil War, including on the Union side, which distressed them. And they realized by the time they founded the NRA six years later in 1871 that there were two wars in Europe that uh, left an impact on them, what the Franco- uh, the Austro- Austro-Prussian War, the, the Prussian War against Austria, and then the Franco-Prussian War that followed. And in each of those wars, a smaller empire defeated two, two larger empires in no small part due to better rifles and better marksmanship on the part of their soldiers. So the men who founded the NRA were concerned that the, that the United States was a rising power, was likely to get into conflicts with European powers, and they wanted to make sure that America was ready. So they formed the NRA to prepare to train soldiers and able-bodied civilians how to properly handle and fire weapons in anticipation of future wars. And, and so what was the deficit that they perceived with the U.S. government? I mean, was it a function they had just come out of a, a war that uh, conscripted um, just about everybody that it could, who was male and over the age, I don't know, of whatever it was, probably their teens. Um, and they just felt that the the U.S. military wasn't as professionalized as it should be um, in terms of training? Well, the men who founded it were concerned uh, about officers who were more interested in having soldiers march in formation uh, in, in unison than about marksmanship. And they realized that the government bureaucracy was not likely to move quickly enough. So they decided and wrote that a private initiative was needed. So it was kind of an enlightened thinking at the time that they wanted to support the United States government and support the United States military. But they thought the best way to do this, instead of arguing through the bureaucracy, would be to set up a private initiative to improve marksmanship among among American soldiers and able-bodied men. I, I guess what I'm getting at is, was this, um, like, how how warranted was it, that concern? Or was there a certain amount of, like, of, uh, I don't want to go too far with this, but, and maybe I'm, I'm projecting here, but, um, you know, was there a certain amount of paranoia that was associated with that? You know, when we're talking about, like, I mean, yeah, I suppose there's going to be some conflicts. I mean, what 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 was what was the the you know where was the that expert marksmanship employed? I should say, I guess. I mean, to the extent of their training. I mean, it, or, or it, was it ever was was that was that was that expertise ever put to use in terms of uh, a, a war? Or was that something that they were just, I don't know, maybe a hammer looking for a nail? No, I think I don't think it was paranoia at all. It was a real fear. Uh, they realized that they that the United States was a rising power. It was the start of the Gilded Age. Uh, the the railroads had been built now from coast to coast, uh, and they 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 expected the United States, and they had an unabashed imperial outlook. 
uh, for the United States. They expected the United States to expand its reach overseas, and they expected the United States to get involved in other wars. That did not happen until World War I, but when it did happen in World War I, uh, both of the co-founders were still alive when it, when it started, and uh, one of the co-founders' colleagues wrote a poem to him uh, vindicating their view that this was necessary and it took a while. Unfortunately, the United States didn't get into any wars besides the Indian, the wars against Native Americans, the so-called Indian wars that, that uh, picked up again after the Civil War. Uh, but overseas, there was, there, the United States stayed out of international conflicts until World War I. But it was a legitimate concern at the time uh, and, it, and it ended up being proved right. And the NRA continued to provide these marksmanship services right through World War II and even up to uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, and they were credited by military officers, including a number of presidents, Eisenhower and others, for their contribution. So I think it was, it was genuine. Okay. And so um, the, um, and at what point did they start getting even remotely political? I know like in 1934 you write that they they weighed in on uh, a ban on essentially, uh, I guess, maybe Tommy guns. Is that what they were at that time or uh, some type of, um, uh, of machine guns, essentially? Was that the first time that they had like dipped into uh, any type of uh, political issue? The first time they got political, they started to write in a political manner was in 1922 in the American Rifleman. And they were concerned about two things. One was a New York state law, the Sullivan Law, which is still on the books, that was passed in 1911. The NRA said nothing about it when it was passed. But over the ensuing decade, they were concerned that this law might be spreading to other states. And they started to realize that they needed to think about defending the rights of gun owners. And the other thing that motivated them at the time was the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, the communist takeover in Russia by the Bolsheviks. Uh, in 1917. And then by five years later, they also noted that the, the new government of Russia, the communist government of Russia, had outlawed civilian ownership of firearms. So they put these two uh, facts together, the 1911 New York law, and then the uh, Bolshevik revolution. And they wrote a, a rather strong editorial in 1922, uh, saying raising the specter that gun rights was important. They didn't use that term, but that's what they meant. And then they stayed relatively silent on the matter, uh, monitoring things, but not saying much about it, until the 1920s in Prohibition and the gangster days of Al Capone. And then finally in 1934, as part of the reforms that came uh, ending Prohibition, they also supported a law uh, and testified in Congress in support of that law, which ended up outlawing all, not just Tommy guns, but machine guns is the term, in the bill, in the law, but it's actually all fully automatic weapons. And that, uh, that law uh, has stayed on the books. But they didn't embrace gun rights as an unyielding uh, aim, uh, quote unquote, like they do today until 1977. So for, for, from, 1930, from the 1930s through the early 1970s, the NRA supported gun control uh, of various kinds and did not take a strong position on gun rights and then in 77, they had an internal gun rights revolt known within the law as the Cincinnati Revolt, which changed the NRA overnight into America's largest and most powerful gun rights organization. All right. I want to I want to work my way up uh, to 77. But just in terms of the Sullivan sure. Act, that was uh, that is that basically says you need a license to carry a weapon that is small enough to conceal, essentially. Right. That's correct. And that's correct. And so there was I mean, there was I mean, what was the what was the concern? I mean, that seems like a that, I mean, that that seems, you know, I mean, not as extreme or I guess as intense. Uh, but that seems fairly consistent with where they are today on some level. Right. I mean, this is just you need a license if you're going to have a concealed weapon. I, I don't know. Maybe it's just from my perspective. It doesn't seem that dramatic what were they were they was this all part of and we're going to get to this their their ideology of 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 a fear of a slippery slope well it was the beginning of that that notion that the Sullivan law could be repeated and it could limit the ability of gun owners to purchase weapons freely uh but that that editorial stood alone for a very long time and then in 34 they supported 
uh, this the National Firearms Act that outlawed fully automatic weapons and restricted firearms on a federal level. And the NRA was quite happy with that okay. uh, and thought it was a good law. So they um, uh, that 22 editorial was the first inkling, but they continue to support gun control for another 50 years. All right. So let's talk about the Cincinnati revolt in 1977. It is the. Um, uh the the one that I guess brought Harlan Caters uh, uh, to the fore. Um, w- uh, uh, tell us about Carter. Carter sorry, I uh, can't read my own writing. W- um, w- tell us what what um, w- what were the dynamics behind that? So you have these like ge- I guess these genetic strands that may be in there in terms of of gun rights, but to the extent that that at that point the NRA had weighed in on anything, they came out in support of of the 34 restrictions of the 68 restrictions in the gun control act. Um, what, what happened in 77? Well, it was this 1968 gun control act that radicalized the group that ended up taking over the NRA nine years later. And the 68 law was passed in the wake of the assassinations of, uh, of, of president John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr. And then Bobby Kennedy, those three assassinations uh, motivated uh, many in Congress to decide, and the NRA to look at the matter and say, look, we don't believe in taking an ostrich-like attitude toward gun control. We know that modern society has new problems that require new solutions, and that that the, the public is demanding some form of control. So the NRA uh, wrestled with that legislation for, an, for a, quite a while until it finally came out and supported it. And then there was a group, the dominant group in the NRA after that law and into the early 70s was really uh, uh, much more interested in promoting marksmanship and outdoor sports and hunting. And their plan was to shift the NRA's headquarters, to move the NRA's headquarters from Washington, D.C. to the Rockies. And they were looking at facilities in New Mexico where they set up one and also Colorado to make it really a sporting organization that had little or nothing to do with politics and that was content with gun control. And they also at the time were greener or as green as Sierra Club, uh, coming out in favor of defending the polar bear, coming out in favor of wildlife conservation, and even writing an editorial suggesting that there should be a tax on ammunition to fund wildlife conservation, something they would never said, uh, say today. And then in 77, these hardliners, Harlan B. Carter, uh, who had, uh, as well as a man named Neil Knox, organized a takeover in Cincinnati, largely through Neil Knox's gun magazine columns outside the NRA that brought up uh, over 500 of their supporters to this annual meeting. And they, they raised allegations of, of uh, using the old guard of being a sellout, including some secret recordings uh, about, the, about them discussing working with the National Education Association Ooh. to support some form of control, right? Something you would never hear today. Then they fired all the members of the old guard one by one and then got themselves elected into power. And the NRA has been uh, oriented toward gun lobbying ever since. How much um, of this, how much is this happening in like a, uh, in, in, in a vacuum or, or, or I should say how much of, because 77 is also when we see, um, right around the time where we see evangelicals become highly politicized. Um, prior to that, evangelicals had more or less, you know, had a uh, leave unto Caesar uh, attitude towards politics. But in the wake of the um, uh, Roe v. Wade, there was a conscious attempt by Republican operatives to uh, basically get the leadership of the evangelical movement to become more uh, politicized. I mean, literally within that uh, year or two. How is there any? Did you ever come across any sort of uh, evidence that there was um, other forces that were in maybe in some way helping these uh, these? I don't know if you want to call it, you know this rebel faction within the NRA to assert itself in any way, or was it completely sort of just coincidental that this is happening um, uh, with the NRA when it's happening in in other sort of, I guess, conservative sectors? Well, the evangelical links didn't come about until much later. What was happening 
uh, by 77 was the rising crime within the United States, as well as the memories of, of, uh, of, of race wars, quote unquote, that occurred in 68. And the NRA was very much uh, uh, part of uh, that element of the country that was saw very favorably on the film Dirty Harry starring Clint Eastwood, where you have uh, an inspector, uh, Callahan is the character, who takes who, to, who, who bends the law in order to defend uh, innocent victims and takes the law to some degree into his own hands. And then other vigilante movies like Death Wish uh, with Charles Bronson. This was part of that entire era. And the people that, the hardliners in the NRA that took over the organization were concerned about crime and were concerned about uh, the specter of, of further racial unrest in the United States. Um, and, they, and this was also a time after Watergate where there was, the nation itself had lost faith in many government institutions. So the notion of the individual being armed was what really motivated uh, them. They saw that as a solution to society's problems then. And I think that's really what motivated uh, that takeover in 77, the, the revolt. Do I, 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 did any of these folks have any other like sort of um, uh, political uh, affiliations, partisan political affiliations? I mean, I'm just curious, and I'm not saying that it <clears throat> was necessarily tied into evangelicals, but what was clearly happening in that era, and yes, all of that was in the culture at the time, um, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I watched both those movies, uh, as a, as a, probably I was slightly too young to be watching those maybe, but, um, and, uh, but so this is definitely in the culture. I just wonder if there was any, um, uh, you know, expertise that was, was lent and whether there was a perspective of the Republican Party that this this could be a good ancillary uh, outside um, uh, organization that would, you know, help us with this broader push, because all of the themes you're talking about, you know, the the silent majority uh, was, uh, you know, in the air or, or did it and maybe it came out of that, that just that miasma. Yeah, I don't I don't those ties. uh Political ties came later. At the time, the NRA, even after the Cincinnati revolt, was bipartisan in the sense that they were willing to work with Republicans and Democrats, and they found uh, sympathetic Democrats in John Dingell, for instance, in Michigan, who supported them for, uh, for many years until he then uh, eventually turned away from the NRA. But to give you a sense of where they came from, Sam, the, the, the founding father of the Cincinnati revolt, Harlan B. Carter, is a man who is the, was the son of a border patrol officer along uh, the Texas border and himself later became the chief of the US border patrol. When he was a youth, when he was 17 years old, he got into an altercation with three Hispanic youths uh, near his home. And, uh, and uh, he, had, he, was, he, he was attempting to force these three Hispanic youths to, to come with him back to his mother's house so his mother could interrogate him and he had a shotgun. The, the youths resisted, and one of them uh, pu uh, pulled out a knife. And Car Harlan and um, Mr. Carter, the, or the boy, uh, uh, Carter, shot him in the chest. And, um, and there was testimony. This was front page news in the Laredo Times in 1931. And as the boy was dying, his surviving, co his surviving friends testified. He, he, bid, he bid goodbye to his friends and then reached out his hand to this to Carter holding the shotgun, and he said, you're my friend too. And Carter replied, according to the testimony, you're my friend nothing. Carter was then convicted of murder and spent uh, time in jail. And he later had that murder conviction overturned on appeal on the grounds that the jury wasn't given proper instructions on self-defense. Carter then changed his first name, which his birth name was Harlan, with two A's, to Harlan, with the second vowel being an O. And he managed to keep that secret for 50 years until four years after the Cincinnati revolt in 1981, when the New York Times broke the story that he, in fact, had been convicted of this murder and spent time in jail and then later had the conviction overturned. But this, this attitude, this notion, right, Carter had already been putting out before the Cincinnati revolt notions about the fear of government overreach that gun control can lead to a greater police state than we've ever seen in the United States, and that our very freedom uh, would be at stake from gun control. That's something that he introduced in 1975 when he became the NRA's chief lobbyist and started writing columns 
uh, in the American Rifleman. And then later on, during the war on drugs, during the period of, uh, of, of President H.W. Bush, Carter wrote an uh, a, a, a unforgettable editorial in the American Rifleman saying he has a solution. And his solution would be to take uh, concertina wire, barbed wire, and set up essentially what would be concentration camps in the desert for drug suspects, to just corral them all in, let them do, do wilding, quote unquote, inside. So whether this would become, you know, a, a, a prison bullying and, uh, and violence was something that he was not concerned about. There was no concern for the civil rights or the, or, or the innocence or guilt of these suspects. He presumed that they would all be, they would all, they all deserve to be there. And at the same time, he was a strong advocate of, of, of the rights of gun owners, making sure gun owners wasn't punished. This attitude is something that permeated the, uh, the, the, the people that took over the NRA through the Cincinnati revolt. And today, Sam, there's only one statue of a likeness of an NRA leader in the National Firearms Museum inside NRA headquarters in Fairfax, Virginia. And that's a bronze bust to Harlan B. Carter today. Hmm. So he still is the godfather of the modern NRA. And just this last fall, Wayne LaPierre, as he's been under threat from the U.S. Attorney General investigation, as well as criticisms of the lavish spending by his own peers, including Oliver North, referenced Harlan Carter for the first time in decades in his own column, which he was essentially burnishing his own ties to the Cincinnati revolt because LaPierre, the current CEO, joined the NRA uh, uh, its staff one year after the Cincinnati revolt and then became CEO in 1991, a position that he's held then for the past 29 years and still holds. And that and, and, and it was uh, LaPierre's uh, ascent, which um, caused George Herbert Walker Bush to disavow the NRA. Right, eventually. But it was LaPierre's ascent was made possible by his his work lobbying Congress to pass the national uh, the, the Firearms Owners Protection Act in 1986 during the Reagan administration, which weakened and rolled back some of the measures of the 1968 law uh, that had been passed that, that had radicalized the NRA. And that was his, that's what helped him then, after a series of internal scandals with the leadership through the 80s, to, to achieve the post of, of uh, executive vice president is the actual title, uh, reflecting the, the old traditions of the organization to achieve the leadership top uh, uh, executive position of the NRA in 1991. So um, let's so let's uh, fast forward to uh, where we are now with the NRA, but but also like the to, from from an ideological perspective and from uh, sort of the the and, and maybe this is something that you divine from uh, a guy like LaPierre's, um, uh, you know, things that he's written and obviously the things that they have pushed for politically. But um, how much more racially, I mean, because it seems like, I mean, to me that in 77, at the very least, um, this is also, you know, this organization is uh consistent with other um, uh, conservative and, and, and increasingly right-wing organizations, um, also mixing into their ideology a certain amount of, of, of race, um, you know, racial fear, right? Um, uh, how much of that uh, oh. comes in? Well, the NRA has, the, an NRA national annual meeting is wider, even wider than a Republican uh, national convention, the Republican Party convention. So the NRA understands that it has, it has tried very hard to uh, come across as being uh, not a racist organization, not a, an organization that's dominated by, by white men, even though it is. And um, the NRA has tried very hard to diversify its board. It has a gentleman named Alan West, who's a former U.S. Army officer uh, and a former congressman from Florida, who uh, left the army after he admitted uh, and was sanctioned, but still retained his rank after he committed a mock execution of Iraqi of an Iraqi police officer uh, in the recent in the latest Iraq War. Uh, he's one of the one of the strongest African American uh, leaders on the board, and he's actually allied with Oliver North against uh, Lapierre. 
Uh, the NRA has tried to diversify the board by uh, not the, their nominating committee of the board, which has a tremendous amount of power, nominated uh, a man from uh, Antonio Hernandez from Puerto Rico, who had campaigned and, and been an advisor to Mitt Romney's campaign uh, on the board. And that failed because the membership was not impressed. And the membership, very few members actually vote, about 7% each year. But uh, members tend to go with who they know. And the notion of diversity is, and seems to be not as important to those who vote as it is to the board. And then there's a man from Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, Mark Robinson, whose video uh, 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 castigating his own city council for trying to ban a, a knife and gun show uh, after the Parkland Florida shooting in 2018 went viral. He participated uh, and starred in a number of I'm the NRA TV ads, right, which is very important and having a strong articulate uh, black uh, American gun rights advocate was something the NRA saw value in, but they nominated him for the board and the membership didn't vote him in either. So they have had trouble. But the other thing they've done, uh, Sam, is the NRA has invented its own origin story, which interweaves with race and tries to paint essentially a, an inaccurate or false picture, picture of race in the NRA. The modern NRA since 77 has claimed that it is the oldest civil rights organization in the nation. This is not true. The NRA had no mention of gun rights until 1922 for more than 50 years of its existence, as I noted. Uh, uh, the, the oldest uh, civil rights organization in the nation is the National Association of the Deaf, followed by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. But they still claim this regularly. Uh, at their meetings and, and officials, elected officials like Ted Cruz, tend to repeat this at NRA annual meetings. Alan West and Lane LaPierre, but especially Alan West, the African-American board member, also have concocted a tale uh, and was, was announced just last year at the NRA annual meeting in Indianapolis when the infighting also broke out, that the NRA allegedly stood with freed slaves during Reconstruction to help secure their Second Amendment rights. This is absolutely completely invented. The early NRA never got much further south than its own shooting range uh, in what is now uh, uh, Queens, uh, Queens County or Queens and Long Island. Uh, and one of the co-founders, uh, the same uh, also uh, William Kona Church, also wrote editorials and had editorials uh, in his own publication written complaining that the NRA was too provincial, that the NRA needs to have a national presence and has not gotten far beyond its own, its own shooting range or the New York environs, right? So the notion, and he also wrote an 800 page book about Ulysses S. Grant, whom he was an admirer of and his role in the Civil War and Reconstruction. And in that book, he talks about the, the violence against freed slaves and the impunity for those committing violence and other hardships. But he made no mention whatsoever of anyone coming to help uh, to, these, to assist or arm freed slaves during Reconstruction in this book, and he didn't mention any role by the NRA at all. So this, this claim that the NRA helped arm freed slaves, that they just, they've been rolling out slowly in different pieces in writing and then launched at their annual meeting last year in, in Indianapolis is entirely invented. And it's an attempt to paint the, the modern NRA as being more inclusive than it really is. And on top of that, the NRA earlier in 2013 helped uh, finance and supported a scholar who wrote a book claiming that the Holocaust in Nazi Germany was the product uh, to, uh, to, 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 uh, to no, in no small part of gun control. And this is something that Holocaust scholars have routinely uh, uh, said is ridiculous. And the book itself recognizes that they're sort of perplexed that no Holocaust scholars had said it before, and they hadn't said it before because it's simply not true. Right. And there's an abundance of evidence to show that, right? Uh, that there is no, no tradition of gun ownership among the Jewish culture. And even in this book, which claims that, well, they use gun control to, to seize guns from Jews, and that led to the Holocaust, even in the same book, the author admits that the records of these alleged seizures are difficult to locate. So right. the whole thing is, is a canard that they've created. Uh, to paint an image of the NRA being somehow inclusive when it comes to race, 
when that is absolutely not the case. All right. So, Frank, uh, catch us up on what the dynamic is right now. I mean, there's been uh, there's been there's a, there, I think the attorney general's office in New York state is uh, looking into the NRA and investigating it. There is uh, you alluded to a um, an attempt to, I guess, uh, uh, overthrow uh, Wayne LaPierre uh, within the NRA. Where is it now? Is it, I mean, you know, there's this, I, the, we never hear about it, and there's this sort of sense that it's maybe sort of um, uh, in its, uh, uh, you know, in, in some type of death throes, uh, but that's not the case, is it? It's not in death throes, but they face their greatest crisis since the Cincinnati revolt, and LaPierre is still facing the greatest crisis of his career. One of their former board members, one of the, one of the co-founders of the Cincinnati revolt, Neil Knox has compared the NRA board to the Politburo, right? A communist Politburo. And they are an ironclad organization when it comes to secrecy, very hard to penetrate. What, which, what was unusual was a year over a year ago uh, in the spring in Indianapolis when the infighting suddenly broke uh, right, right the Friday night of their annual meeting in the Wall Street Journal. And that, uh, that led to this split between between a camp led by Oliver North and a camp led by LaPierre. That hadn't happened in decades, and it's something that uh, shows a tremendous amount of instability within the organization. But LaPierre secured the loyalty of most of his board and put that insurgency led by Oliver North to rest when last summer, when he compelled President Trump to reverse himself on background checks after the El Paso and Dayton shootings, Trump came out and said he was considering background checks. LaPierre had a few phone conversations with him, leading President Trump to say that, no, he was no longer considering them. And he got Trump to say they call it the slippery slope, right, which is a complete invention. Every other advanced nation on earth has gun control, and it hasn't led to a tyrannical takeover or some kind of genocidal regime. But this is the claim that the NRA has made and LaPierre has made in bits and pieces in different forms that even something as innocuous sounding as, as background checks could be a slippery slope leading to gun confiscation and that gun confiscation would lead to disarmament and then that would lead to genocide, right? There's no evidence for this, but this is the claim they've made. But LaPierre has regained ground within the organization by getting Trump to say that because the, the board has supported him largely because of his results. And also he's a skill for, a skill for player behind the scenes. So, However, the attorney general investigation by New York led by Letitia James poses an ongoing serious threat because there's credible allegations that the NRA moved money from its tax exempt foundations of which there are two, to its operating or its lobbying uh, efforts through its main organization. And that would be a violation of of, of federal tax law, but also New York state tax law. And the NRA, for whether they like it or not, is still incorporated in the state of New York where it was chartered in 1871 when it was founded. So, Frank, let, so let's talk about this. I mean, when you say, like, the, you know, there's concern, they're concerned if there's, uh, if the slippery slope continues, there'll be genocide. I think they're specifically, I mean, it seems to me when they're talking about genocide, they're talking about the white genocide, right? Um and um, and 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 one of the things that I've been fascinated by is when you're worried about a tyrannical government that is going to come out with like a military or paramilitary, let's say, with all these type of weapons. And that's why the citizenry needs to be armed. Um, well, I mean, for the past, I don't know, three or four weeks. Right. We've had um, at least some uh, sense that, you know, some of that is happening. Where is the NRA been in terms of supporting those people who are on the 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 uh, the receiving end of that government tyranny that they've been telling us about for so long? Where are they? There was a um, a, a case in, in Virginia, I guess, uh, just a, maybe a couple of weeks ago of uh, an armed a uh, black man who was arrested for, I think it was pointing a rifle at some uh, bikers or something, but, you know, in his own self-defense. And, 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 and um, where where is the NRA? Like, aren't they supposed to be? Uh, presumably, the, the story they tell about themselves, we'd see a lot more of them at this moment 
protecting folks like the protesters and this uh, this black uh, gun owner. Well, once the pandemic was underway, right in the beginning of the pandemic, just as the protest against White House recommended, ironically, uh, uh, health measures uh, imposed by Democratic governors, the NRA released a video. And one of the things it said and one of the one of the themes that it put out there was that there is no more important a time to exercise your Second Amendment rights than during times of public unrest. And that was the NRA's message. And that essentially seemed to signal support for these protests that then escalated uh, over those ensuing weeks. And the NRA has put out this ideology uh, of the slippery slope more strongly than any other group in the country. But what's happened is this ideology has been infused with QAnon and a lot of conspiracy theories. And now the NRA is looking relatively moderate to some of these groups. And some of the groups that have arisen, including those funded by the DeVos family have tried to position themselves as being more radical and being more re- more pro-gun rights than even the NRA, which is an indication that this this ideology is spread beyond even what the NRA uh, was putting out there. At the same time, the NRA seen, has been completely silent about uh, the protests by Black Lives Matter uh, supporters and others in the name of George Floyd and other African Americans who have been abused or killed. Uh, in police custody. They said absolutely nothing about that. They also said nothing about the case of Philando Castile, uh, the gun owner who was shot by a police officer who had a who had a legal permit to have a concealed weapon. And as he was reaching for the permit, the officer shot him. They said nothing about that, even though two of their former spokespeople did say something about that. Dana Lash said something about it, as well as uh, Colion Noir. But the NRA itself said nothing. And then the case you're talking about occurred on June 1st in Virginia, when a group of a family of uh, of, of local white residents and one other person who maybe who had a different last name, maybe an uncle, came to the home of a black preacher, preacher and dumped a refrigerator on his property. The preacher came out and said, "Hey, what are you doing? Stop doing this! I don't want your refrigerator. Right. You can't dump it on my property." And they began to verbally and physically assault him. He pulled out his legally uh, registered uh, handgun, I believe it was, and, uh, and then called 911. The, the, the officers who arrived spoke only to the, to, the, to the people who were dumping the refrigerator, right, this white family and, their, and, their, uh, and another, another gentleman, and then went to the black pastor, did not ask him any questions, just arrested him for having brandished a firearm. The, uh, the sheriff, then later released the black pastor and apologized to him and said if uh, and then arrested uh, the people who had dumped the refrigerator, giving them various uh, charges, including the assault for those that allegedly assaulted him. And the sheriff said, well, I would have done the same thing. And under those circumstances, I sent an uh, uh, I, I we're waiting to see. I'm waiting to see if the NRA will respond to this. I suspect they will not. But the NRA clearly has. Uh, a blind spot when it comes to gun owners uh, who are who are who are African American, right? they one of their one of their most uh, famous cases within their own lore is a man named Kenyon Ballou, who was a gun collector who, whom ATF or federal agents kicked down his door, ended up shooting him and wounding him and 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 permanently impairing him, and that was a rallying cry for what helped lead to the Cincinnati revolt. This outrageous abuse of gun owners and the American rifleman since 77 and to some degree uh, even starting before is full of cases of gun owners being uh, uh, abused or allegedly abused at the hands of, of federal authorities and other government authorities. But when it came to the case of Philando Castile and now in this case of this black pastor, the NRA seems to be silent. We'll see if they decide to change that with the current circumstances, but I wouldn't hold my breath. Okay, so lastly, Frank, um, what, where, where, where can we anticipate? Like, you know, what uh, is has? Uh, I guess the future of this organization is, at this moment, in in many respects, a function of these investigations into its um, uh, the perhaps misuse of funds. Um, give me a sense of like where you anticipate, where where, where you anticipate the NRA will be. Um, you know. Six months, a year from now, uh, will they exist? If they are, how strong will they be? I mean, 
I, I guess there's just a lot of factors involved with this. But give us a sense of what you you know when you think about uh, what their future is. What what is it? Your thoughts? Well, the attorney general can't simply decree that the NRA can no longer exists, but they can right. if they find if they if they choose to find the organization responsible for tax fraud, illegal moving of funds, they can impose sanctions against the organization. And there also is a possibility they can impose sanctions against some of the executives involved. And I think the NRA, that could hurt, severely hurt the NRA, if not cripple the NRA. At the same time, though, the NRA is constantly putting out the message and has been ever since this investigation began, that they are under siege from the attorney general. And this is worse than, uh, than communism uh, back during the Soviet Union. So that's also unified them. So we'll see how far this investigation goes. I think it was likely to hurt them, but not destroy them. However, we have an election coming up, and it looks like uh, President Trump and the Republican Party are not doing well in the polls. If, President, uh, if, if the election occurs and President Trump is not reelected, and there is a new president, presumably Joe Biden, and the, and the Democrats were also to retake the Senate, then I think the NRA would, be, uh, would face the fact that they would finally have, be facing a hostile uh, executive as well as a hostile uh, Congress in both houses, and that gun control would be passed over their objections, which has never happened since 77. The NRA has been incredibly effective on its own terms at expanding gun rights in states by passing, helping to pass concealed carry laws in most states in the nation over the past 30 years, and at the same time, blocking federal gun control at every step, including after the Newtown Sandy Hook massacre of children, as well as after the Parkland high school uh, shootings. So that's something, that's, I think, a greater concern for the NRA. However, it could also increase their membership and increase their coffers. So for those that, are, that remain in the NRA, that may mean the organization may keep going because the NRA has always done better financially when it's in opposition, when they're right. facing Democrats in power as opposed to Republicans who are allied with them. The book is The NRA, The Unauthorized History. Frank Smith, we will put a link to it at majority.fm. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sam. Real pleasure. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught the truth and the light bar The finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I get somewhere the choice is made For the option where you don't get paid Somehow I lost my drive Between the 101 and the 5 Do you know how far The detail takes you Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining Shifted in and 